Here's the plan of attack. Have to get the president out of America without anybody knowing it. Plan was to take him out of his ranch in Crawford for Thanksgiving. He goes to the ranch two days prior. Everyone thinks he's going to have Thanksgiving dinner at the ranch. All the news media were told that he, Bush 41, President Bush, Barbara Bush were all coming in, family all coming in. It was let out to the media. Our plan of attack was to sneak him off the ranch. So what they did was they had one guy stay on the ranch as a Secret Service agent, talking into his wrist all night long, letting everybody on that facility know the president is still there. So not all the Secret Service were briefed in. Days prior, they had a black minivan, and they would keep bringing it on and off the ranch so that everybody got used to this minivan leaving. Game day. President, Dr. Rice, get into the black minivan, they leave, go off the ranch. Nobody thinks anything of it. Secret Service guy that's read in the whole day, whole night, just sits there talking in, yeah, president's in the swimming pool, president's on the back lawn, president's having his chicken sandwich. So everybody thought he was still there. He was so good at it that after we came back from Baghdad and were flying out, the president had already talked to Mrs. Bush and let her know every, he was safe and everything was fine. She goes out and talks to one of the agents out front and asks the agent, do you know when the, the president's coming back? You know, you know what, what's his status? They assume it's Bush 41 coming in. They say, yeah, actually, he's on his way here right now. She goes, no, 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 my husband. He goes, oh, he's out in back, ma'am. He is, yeah, da, da, da. yeah, he's out in the back, ma'am. Back lawn, moving in. <laughs> Best ever. <laughs> president gets on the plane in Waco. We've taken the press from Waco. The, there's two press pools down in Waco. Told them to go to the Baylor gym. We picked the first pool, brought them out to the plane, took all their communications away from them, brought them on the aircraft. We then took the aircraft and went to Andrews Air Force Base. At Andrews Air Force Base, the second 747 was waiting for us. It had been fully loaded. All of my crew knew nothing about going to Baghdad. I wasn't gonna take a chance anybody would call home or tell anybody about it. They got told en route. The crew back in Washington, D.C., knew nothing about it either. They knew not where they were going, nor did the maintenance guys. All they knew is they were told to refuel the jet, fill it full of gas, and be ready to go. The president gets off the plane. As he's walking from one plane to the other in the hangar, my top cop shuts down all communications in the hangar so nobody can call out. There are no cell phones. Yeah, a little capability, all you avionics guys probably know you can, you can knock out cell phone coverage in a lot of places. Kind of knocked it out for a lot of people there. Unfortunately, we brought some press from Washington, D.C. that day. They were sitting waiting for us to group with the other press we brought from Waco. One of the men, we'd asked everybody to give up their cell phones. This guy had left a cell phone in his sock. This president gets off. He starts to use his cell phone to give away, you know, so he'll be the first, you know, news organization to have it. The president walks by, gives him the little like that. But at the same time, the top cop, Will Chandler, goes ahead and introduces himself. A blinding tackle. <laughs> Nelson, man, all right, question for you. Whether you're Air Force, military, do you take the man with you or do you leave him there? Take the man with you. There's nothing that duct tape and rope will not fix. <laughs> Brought the guy with us, not a problem. He understood now how important it was. President Bush reemphasized to everybody on board how important it was and that he would turn the plane around if the word got out because he was not going to take a chance. Servicemen and women would be injured. Abaddon is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy-to-use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head downtime and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidine. President of the United States comes up to us. He's flying with us the whole time, gets a little sleep. Then as we're trucking across the North Atlantic, we have planes above us and below us, North Atlantic, typical every thousand feet going across. As we start to head into the London coast, we definitely knew there was gonna be daylight as we hit the coast, kind of scared to death that a plane around us would see Air Force One. As we cut into the London controllers, no one has said anything. The Air Force guys, you know, we're jumping up and high-fiving each other. Everything's perfect. Then we get the faded radio call. London, is that Air Force One? Oh, you're killing me. It was British Airways above us. So we thought, well, you know, that's probably who it is. So we start making a turn. The London controller comes back and goes, no, that's a Gulfstream Five. Wow. 
What we've been doing the whole time is changing our call sign and changing the type aircraft throughout all the flight plans. We had just changed over as soon as we hit the London coast to a Gulfstream 5. Thank God. The person in the aircraft that was ahead of us, all he said was, a Gulfstream 5. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> that individual did not let anything out, thank God. As we're heading into Baghdad, the President of the United States comes to the cockpit. You can see him in the picture here. He's got his normal business suit on, but uh, pants, but he's wearing a white t-shirt. Comes up behind me, does like he always does. Leaning on me, hitting me, going, hey, tell me, what's it like bringing a commander in chief into a war zone? You know, I'm a professional. Oh, Mr. President, it's the best ever. Can't wait to do it. <laughs> we're, we're trucking on in there. The navigator, George Pavelko's, uh, he's working on all kinds of things, uh, using the military portion of the uh, satellites, kind of honing everything in to make sure that we can find the airfield. Okay, the president then asked the question, where is this triangle they talk about, the Sunni triangle? Well, if you look in the picture, you can see it's completely overcast below me, which was great, so that nobody in the city could see me. At the same point, though, I'm getting calls from my guys on the ground telling me, hey, the overcast is moving. You will not believe this, but the end of the runway is where the overcast ends. I mean, yeah, it's got to end somewhere, but why did it have to end there that night? So it ended there, and it was clearing a million beyond the airport, and it's slowly moving off the airport, so I don't have any cloud cover. But the president asked where the triangle's at. I then go over the interphone to George, my nav. George, throw me a bone here. He's asking where the triangle's at. George's like, sir, I am really busy skewing these satellites, and uh, right now the TAC end's 30 degrees off. It's not locking on. The satellites are saying we're 20 left. And I was like... Okay, well, you know, where, where do you want me to keep heading? He goes, just keep heading straight. We're going to figure it out in a minute, but you figure out where that triangle's at. Got it. So I look out the window, and I go, yeah, the first, sir, the first point's right there. That's triangle. And, you know, hey, uh, Scotty Goodwin's my co-pilot. Scotty, you see the other point? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah it's right there down there. And I go, what? and there's the other point of the triangle. And the president's laughing his head off. He goes, you have no clue where that triangle's at, do you? <laughs> not a clue, not a clue. He then asked the question, what's the status of the self-defense? You know, how's it going to work? And so, well, the flight engineer, he's going to handle all the self-defense. If anything starts happening, he's going to get real busy. He's going to start talking to me, explaining a lot of things to me. And, uh, you know, we'll take care of it. The plane's heavily defended. Don't worry about it. He goes, well, what happens if we get hit? Uh, loud thump, uh, man flight, as you know, it changes. Um, <laughs> So we're, we're laughing, but then he goes, oh, that was a dumb question. And I mean, all of us professional Air Force officers at the same time, no, Mr. President, that's not a dumb question. That's a perfectly reliable, you know, that's a great question. Great question, yeah, yeah. But he laughs. But at the same point, a woman comes into the cockpit, and she goes, Mr. President, is it okay to flash? He turns, he looks at her, and he goes, absolutely, but then pull those pants right back up. <laughs> that was my man. He, he brought a lot of the tension down at that point. We brought him into Baghdad. Welcome to Airborne, the latest programming initiative from the Aero News Network. Hosted by Ashley Hale, Airborne is a visually stunning weekly high-def newscast featuring guest appearances and commentary from some of aviation's leading dignitaries, as well as ANN's own familiar faces. With aggressive reporting, extensive video, and a number of special aero features, Airborne offers truly engaging, fast-paced aero news content and analysis of lasting value to all of aviation. We changed call signs and we changed type aircraft just prior to going in there so that the military would be expecting a large C-5 on a USO mission. We went ahead and landed, blacked out, came in and landed on the airport. At the end of the runway we stayed, we filled up with 14 fuel trucks supplied by the Army. Unknowingly, they were, uh, they were running out there. They were not happy supporting on Thanksgiving Day. The troops were sitting in the chow hall in the middle of the airfield waiting for an unknown VIP to show up. The day prior, they'd had Senator Clinton and a few other senators show up. They assumed it was going to be the same group of folks. The president goes to the dinner. He's standing behind the partition that you see behind him right now, General Sanchez, Ambassador Bremer. They have a letter from the President of the United States. They ask the question, you know, who should be reading it? Finally, General Sanchez says, why don't we have the president read it? The president comes around the partition. Troops go wild. Their commander in chief's there for dinner. That was the mission we were supposed to do. We were very successful at that mission. That's exactly what he wanted to do. The president went ahead and served the troops. The president of the United States then came back to us. As he came back to us, the plane was completely blacked out. Secret Service and an armored personnel carrier bringing the president back. They call out. They want to know if the plane is still there because they can't see it. That's not a great feeling. So 
we should pop a couple of uh, green flares there so they can see where we're at. We're all wearing night vision goggles. President comes up to the side of the plane. He goes to the big top cop. Hey, is anybody around the aircraft so, you know, supporting us, any troops and all that stuff? Sure enough, we'd had a special ops team supporting the aircraft out in front of the aircraft, 50 cal machine gunner with a scrub bush on his helmet sitting there. The president starts to point out to him. Big Will stops the man from pointing, stops the president. Doesn't want to give away the man's position. Big Will gives the president night vision goggles so he can see the guy. Goggles on, president just gives the kid a thumbs up, kid gives him a thumbs up, and that's all it took. Secret bond between the two men. That's what the president was about. Jumps on the plane, we take off, blast out of there. Once we level off, the president asked me to come downstairs. I come downstairs, I go in the conference room. He and his staff stand up. They thank me for a job well done. I asked the president what it was like having dinner with the troops. He said he didn't get a chance to have dinner with the troops. He said he got a chance to serve the finest men and women in the United States of America. I'll never forget it. Mission successful. What a great man, what a great mission, what a great team. Everything was successful because your products got me there, found it, even though the tack end was off 30 degrees, we still knew exactly where we were. Subsequent trips into Baghdad, Afghanistan, president up in the cockpit with us. Last trip of the President of the United States with us, we brought him back into the Air Force One hangar. The maintenance guys pulled the window out of his office, the same window that he looked out on September 11th. The maintenance guys etched into that window the Manhattan skyline with the Twin Towers. At the top of the window, it says, the right man at the right time. The crew of Air Force One thanks you, President Bush. I strongly believe that. I have had a lot of great honors. I was pinned on a colonel by two presidents, Bush 41 on the one, one wing, Bush 43 on the other wing. Can't complain. Distinguished Flying Cross in the Oval Office from the President of the United States. No complaints. Last picture they took of me as I was flying back from uh, Waco, about to give it up to the presidential pilot number 13, and then retire and go work for Discount Tire. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for allowing me to speak today, and thank you so much for everything you do. Aero TV's live coverage of the 55th annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show is brought to you in part by the following sponsors.